What's up everyone? Welcome to Hustle is for Life Motivation. I am your host Talal and this is the YouTube channel where you come to find out what it takes to create holistic success by diving deep into the minds and the lives of amazing thought leaders from all over the world. Tonight's topic is going to be all about developing emotional mastery. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you a parent? If the answer is yes, you know what I'm talking about because your emotional emotions can go from absolutely cool, chilled out, like an ice cube to kill in an instant, right? Your kids can drive you nuts. What do you do? Okay, those that's the big question that we're trying to answer. What do you do? How do you actually master emotional mastery yourself? And then how can you actually create emotional mastery in your family with your children and maybe help them develop emotional mastery as well our guest tonight is nicole talfer she's absolutely amazing guess what she's from the uk i'm super excited because guess what all the other guests i've had they've been out of the uk for like i don't know i can't even remember how many guests i've had last like since i've had somebody from the uk so i'm really excited um she's got a marketing background and she started her journey into looking at this this whole thing about developing emotional mastery as a parent because she had pain in her own life she was a parent herself and she was experiencing pain and she just wanted to know well how how do you get past it okay where are the answers where are the solutions to the questions that were presenting themselves to her so she started to blog she started to research she connected with top neuroscientists top parenting coaches, top psychologists, psychiatrists all over the world. She then learned, she spent a lot of time, she spent like years learning about this stuff, okay? Um, and now she's actually a coach and she has just launched her new eight-week course called Connected Family Blueprint, which helps you develop, basically, I, I, it's, it's a plan. It's a step-by-step -step plan that helps you develop emotional mastery. And I'm super excited to have Nicole here. Nicole, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. I am so excited and honored to be here. I cannot wait for our interview tonight. Awesome. Well, let's dive straight in. Nicole, I know you have an amazing story. We were talking a little bit about it before we press the record button. So take us back. Take us back to the point in time where you were looking for answers um, and you were experiencing pain in your life by just, just like a natural thing, right? Being a parent. And so many people go through this in their life where they're a parent. But a lot of the times we just have the reference points that we experienced when we were young as kids, right? So that's our blueprint. But as we're growing up, we don't really get any formal education on it. We don't get any coaching. We don't get any training. We don't get any advice. It's just something we're thrown into. We're just expected to work out by ourselves. So take us back in time. And then how did you start your journey on researching all these different things um, and uh, developing yourself to the point where you're now coaching? You know what? My journey actually started all the way back in my childhood. So when I, I grew up in the Caribbean, in the beautiful island of Trinidad, right? Um, and back then, and I'm not going to share my age, but it's a long time ago. Back then, parenting included regular spankings. Um, I would even say daily spankings for kids, right? And, and I was fortunate. My parents didn't spank. But what it meant was that I had a childhood view of what that did to kids around me. And, and I can remember the day that I really made the commitment to myself that I would do parenting differently when I grew up. I was about 12 years old and my little cousin was about four at the time and he was running around. He was really mischievous and my aunt had just given him a bath and about 15 minutes later, I don't know how, but he had managed to get himself completely dirty from head to toe, 15 minutes after bath. And my poor aunt, she was exhausted and she was tired. So she just grabbed him. She grabbed him by the hand, marched him into the bedroom. She took a belt out of the cupboard, wrapped it around his leg and tied him to a bedpost. And she left him there. And it's still a story that hurts because I stood there as a 12 year old and I looked at him and he had these eyes that were filled with agony. Mm. And, and I felt powerless. As mm. a 12 year old girl, I felt powerless. And I made a commitment to myself that day. I would never, ever do this to my kids. Mm. I was sure that when I grew up, I would learn everything I could 
so that I could do better. You see, because it's easy I'm t attempting to say she was an awful mom, but she wasn't. She was and she, she still is. She's a great mom, you know, the kind of mom that will stand in the line of fire for their kids. She's that kind of mom. But she was doing what was popular at the time in her way, trying to parent more gently rather than spanking. And if we fast forward 17 years, I became a mom and I kept my promise. I researched everything. I started with my local library. I read every book, watched every TV program, and then I started following them to a T, right? I have a research background because you mentioned my background is in marketing, but I never questioned what I read. I just followed. I never questioned what I saw on television. Mm. I just followed. And one day, my kids, my kids are, are 20 months apart, so they're quite close in age. I'm fortunate they don't fight every day, but <laughs> one day, they were about two or three, and the three-year-old lost his temper. I think his brother was just taking his toys away from him too much that day, and he bit his brother. And I turned around, and I saw the perfectly imprinted teeth marks on his cheek, and I lost it. I could honestly tell you, I could feel the steam coming out my ears. I grabbed him took him, put him in a naughty corner, and I went down, and I gave the speech about naughty corners, why you're here, how long you would stay. And then I turned to walk away from him, and something made me look back. And when I look back, there, looking at me, with the same eyes I saw from my cousin, the same eyes filled with agony. And I grabbed him up, and I hugged him, but I couldn't understand. I was like, God, how did I get here? I studied everything. Mm. I read everything. There must be something that I was missing. And that's where my journey started. And I start to look for the real research. And by that, I mean, I want to be clear, not the people that the media made popular. Yeah. But the people that have done research for 20, 30 years, followed kids and families to see what was the outcome of different things. Um, and to be honest, there's hundreds, there's hundreds of research papers. So I wasn't, I wasn't lost for research. And all of the research that I read, the more I read, the angrier I became. Because all of it showed me quite clearly that all of the things I've been following was just taking me away from my goals for my kids. And that anger, it turned to a passion, right? A passion to make sure I could get the real experts and share their parents and do as much work to make sure that the real teaching of how to guide kids became popular. And as I mentioned before, after a few years, maybe about four or five years, I kind of had my ego polished. Yeah, I thought, okay, now I've got it. Now you kids can bring anything to mommy. Mommy can figure out how to manage just about anything through my way. And my son might have been about eight or nine at the time, and we were actually having an argument. I can't remember what we were arguing about, but what I do remember is the look he gave me. He glared at me like with real anger and rage, and he said to me, I hate you. You're the worst mother in the world. And I got to tell you, it's, oh, it, still, it still gives me a slap in the heart each time I tell that story. But I didn't go back to my research. I didn't take three deep breaths and I didn't stay calm. I totally lost it. I lost my head. I yelled at him, screamed at him to go to his room. And then I sat there feeling a bit stunned, a bit embarrassed, a bit guilty that mm. I'd lost my patience. But so hurt that he would even say those words to me. And then I thought, what am I missing? What am I missing here? So I said I needed more than just the research. I needed to find experts who've been doing this and helping families all over the world to be able to show me what I'm missing. And there's one of the experts that I met along my journey called Dr. Gordon Newfield. And and he said to me, he's like, he's beautiful, like such a beautiful, loving soul. And he said to me, we were never meant to guide kids whose hearts we do not hold. Mm. And the first time he said that to me, I was like, I was like, what? What do you mean? And I'm like, I know my kids love me. I know I love my kids. But in the heat of the moment, when the fire is on, that doesn't help me. And I studied it, I studied it, and then I got it. What he was saying was that in every moment, not just ge as a general statement of I love you and you love me, but in every moment that I wanted to guide, I had to first connect. Mm. And that's where I am. And now that's what I'm trying desperately to be able to share with families because guidance, true guidance comes from that connection. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, no, perfect. I love that story. So powerful. And you, 
and, and this is the thing uh, for a lot of people like we talked about before they have certain reference points and since they only have that reference point they they just repeat that behavior yes. but when you like for, in your case you made the commitment and it took you a, a whole long a very long time to get to this stage but you stuck with it and i think for a lot of people that's what they find difficult to stick with it because it takes a very long time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources to make a breakthrough. Yes, it does. It does. And, but I think you've got to be really clear. There are two things I think there's nothing more important. Your intimate relationships and relationships you have with your kids, mm. you really define the level of happiness you get to share in your life. You understand? You can have as much money, as much physical possessions but without those things in balance without those things thriving and lifting you up there's there's a sense that something's missing always so for me those were the things that i needed to get right before everything else so i was committed i was i'm in for the long haul <laughs> to make <laughs> sure i can get it right <laughs> awesome yeah and, and i think that that's a big one that's that's a really really big thing uh, and i see that it's a sort of thing come again and again in different conversations with different thought leaders all over the world um when i have them on the show and they talk about you know just keep going like they just say, I just kept going. I, I just carried on. I just never stopped. I just never looked back. And these are the kind of phrases they repeat again and again. And yes. because it does take time, it does take effort. It does take time, you know, and, and energy and resources to get to that breakthrough. But if you stick with it, you will get there. Like there's no reason you won't get there. It's just the fact that you just have to stick with it long enough. Um, so I, I absolutely That's love right. that. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And when you look at connection, so I like to use analogies when I describe things to parents. Um, and even when I got to the point where I understood that connection is what I needed to build, figuring out how to build connection was another different story. Mm. Um, but here's an analogy. If you consider that as a parent, you're the computer. You're the computer and your child is the accessory, like a printer. Yeah. No matter what you want to do, if you don't plug in that computer, you can't send a message to that printer. That printer can't hear you no matter what. So you first have to plug into you. That's the first thing. If that printer is not plugged in, you can send as many pages to print as you want. If that printer is not plugged in, it can't hear you. So for connection to really work, you first have to plug into you. And by that, I mean, you have to tap into the best of you. What I call your inner being or my soul. And it's not really about what I believe. It's just what's, what's that richest part of you, that place where you go, where you know you're in your peak state, mm. your absolute best. That's the part you want to connect to. And then once you're connected there, what you'll find is that you naturally inspire the people around you to connect to their inner being. And now the dance starts. That's when the real guidance happens. And that's, it's a journey. But if parents can get that, it completely transforms parenting. And it takes the struggle and conflict away and really turns families into unstoppable teams. And that's what we want to create. Beautiful. And for people in the audience that turn to you right now, how many of you are out there are parents? How many of you out there are teachers? Guess what? I'm a teacher and I deal with kids every single day. And I think all of this applies to teaching and pretty much any other profession where you are dealing with kids or uh, even other people like, you know, just a normal job. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to, you know, work in a school in educational environment It's just connecting. And, and I think that's fantastic advice. I love the analogy, by the way, that you use of a computer and a printer and the computer needs to be plugged in first and then it can send message to the printer, but then you need to plug in the printer to make sure that the printer is actually ready to go as well. Okay. So I absolutely love that. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. And for people in the audience, again, how many times has this happened to you? Where, like Nicole shared her story, and I, I'm pretty sure like this has happened to me because you know I have two kids. Uh, how many times has this happened where the kids are just not listening? They say something, they do something, and it tips you over the edge. But then you have to decide, do you carry on falling down or when you get tipped over the edge, do you fly? Mm. That's your choice. 
So Nicole, share with us some of the things that you found through your research uh, about emotional mastery. How can us as parents uh, or teachers uh, or guardians achieve emotional mastery ourselves? What strategies can we use? What steps are there? What does the process look like? Uh, and then how can we extend that to our children as well? So I think the first thing to recognize is why would you want emotional mastery in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why would I just not be better off at being angry because you've made me angry? And so I start by saying, let's take a step back. Let's kind of get to the helicopter view and really understand emotions. What are emotions and how are they created in the first place? And if you study the science of emotions, emotions themselves are not really made up of anything. Just like thoughts, like you can't, you can't take a brain surgeon and go into the brain and find a thought. It's really just energy moving in our body. But if you look at a few examples in your life, like if you, if you understand, we all know, right? Like two people could be in the same place experience the same thing but take away completely different messages and completely different emotions around those messages and the real difference if you ask yourself what's causing the difference is the fact that those two individuals will have different thoughts about the event so then you kind of scale it back and you realize okay so emotions are produced by thoughts so if my emotions are produced by my thoughts then it's not possible for you to make me feel anything so I first have to get comfortable with owning the fact that how I feel is all on me. And mm. that's a big one because a lot of people want to say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. You don't know the people I live with. You don't <laughs> understand what they do to me. <laughs> but that's the first step. And if you can really own it. And sometimes I think it's just about understanding more about what's happening inside of your body. Um, and the more you understand what's happening inside of your body, the more you can realize that owning the fact that you are responsible for all of your emotions is actually a powerful place because you have no control over the other person, but you have 100% control over you. So now you get all your power back. Uh, and so that's the first step. The second step is understanding what do emotions mean what does it mean when i'm happy this is when i'm sad or i'm angry or i feel jealous all of those emotions and what i think they really mean it's they're a guidance system so when you're driving your car and you you're, you're low on petrol something flashes then you're low on petrol if you're low on oil something flashes you're low on oil yeah if your tire needs pressure something flashes we don't ignore the flash and keep going right the flash means this is something here i'm sending you a message i need you to pay attention so that you can take action and i believe all emotions are the same thing emotions really come to say i'm telling you how far or how close you are thinking the way your inner being thinks so when you're close to looking at something in the same way as your inner being looks at it, as your soul, as your soul, as your, your internal energy. When you look at that in the same way, you feel appreciation, you feel love, you feel joy, you feel compassion and excitement and enthusiasm. Those are all the emotions of love, right? Um, and you can, you, and it's not, it's not because of something. Like when you look at a sunset and it's beautiful and you appreciate it, you're, you're not feeling love because it was just a gray sky and now it's a red sky. You're just feeling love and appreciation for what it is. When you're feeling angry, or sad, or powerless, or, or jealous, those emotions are just an indicator by their intensity to say, you've now moved this far, or this far, yeah? You've moved further and further away from the way your inner being sees it. So really what it is, it's a call back to yourself. So when you're angry, your inner being is just saying, come back to me, come back to me. And, and then you ask yourself, why? Why would I wanna come back to you? Well. well when you're in your peak state, there's a few things you get access to as a human being, right? You get access to greater clarity. You get access to greater creativity. You get access to your intuition. There's so much power when you're in your peak state. When you make a judgment or a solution from peak state versus when you try to come up with a solution when you're raging and angry or you're jealous or you're depressed, those solutions are completely different. 
and the impact on your life is completely different. So the goal then is to only decide, I'm going to make my decisions. I'm going to speak. I'm going to communicate only when I get myself to peak state. Everything else is ineffective. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. No, I love that. Yeah. You really went deep. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, and like you, like you talked about, well, you talked a bunch of other things, but like the, the one thing that really stands out, um, was the fact you said that emotions are guidance systems. They're just warning lights. They're just giving you a warning. And that does not mean that you actually have to, you know, follow that path. You have to go down that path. It's just a warning system to let you know, Hey, this is what's about to happen. You need to take back charge. Do something about it. And here's the challenge, right? If you recognize that all emotions come with a message, every single one, you then have to be open to feeling all of them. Mm. Because as you turn away and say, mm, I'm not going to feel that, that feels sad. Wipe your eyes, wipe your eyes. Yeah, I'm not going to feel sad. You lose the message. Mm. Yeah. So what you have to do is that you have to get so comfortable with each and every one of those emotions that you can use them to climb your way back to peak state. Wow. And that's so. And and for me, that's where that's where the fun begins, right? <laughs> because once you understand, <laughs> once you understand what you're trying to achieve and why, it's now just a matter of practice. Right. So you've been you've been approaching your emotions one way all your life for all of your life. You've been taught that the way you feel is the result of something external to you. It's been a myth. It's easier to it's easier to deal with because that's the way we've been conditioned. But once you recognize that I have a choice and that I get to choose to feel great in each and every moment, irrespective of what is happening and that that choice allows me to access my peak state, allow me to access my intuition, allows me to access inspiration and my creativity. Why would you choose anything else? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. When you decide I'm going to be angry here and I'm going to be angry at you for two days because what you did was really bad. You've got to ask yourself, who are you really impacting? Are you impacting the person you're angry with? Or have you decided to cut yourself off from all the things that are good and important in your own life to help you succeed. And that's where I want to get parents to. Mm, beautiful. And you, you talk about the fact that, you know, the emotions are created by thoughts and your thoughts are your own. So nobody can actually really make you feel anything unless you give them permission. Um, that's really great. And, and the thing I, you know, for the people in the audience, especially if you're a parent or a teacher or you work with uh, other people in any sort of capacity, I guess, is the fact that, well, not just other people, but especially kids, I think this, this specifically applies to kids. First of all, not everybody understands all of these things at a deep level. And secondly, especially kids, they're just like, they have absolutely no way of understanding what all these things are. They, they can't define what a thought is. They probably don't even know what an emotion is. I mean, we try and label things for them and they know names of stuff, but do they really understand the definition? Do they really know what they're going through, what they're experiencing? No, they don't. So if we are, we are, have to go on a journey of practicing this over a period of time in order to gain emotional mastery, then how can we expect so much from kids? I think one of the things we do wrong is the fact that we have the same expectations from kids as we do from other adults or as we do from ourselves. And that's a big one. That's a big one because kids are not capable of that. I would take it one step further and I would okay. say if we're really honest, sometimes we expect more from kids than we expect mm, from ourselves. Wow. We expect our kids to manage their emotions, to be able to respond when they're disappointed because we've said no more than we are when they throw a tantrum. Then we think we're in the right and now I have a right to be upset because look at how you're behaving. The mm. way you're behaving is making me upset. But we don't think that the child has a right to be upset because we said no and they're disappointed. And we yeah. haven't taught them how to manage disappointment yet. Mm. So it could be very hypocritical, but it's hard for parents to own. But once you do, there's freedom at the other side of the door. Perfect. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's go there, Nicole. Talk to us a little bit about how do you actually practice these things? How do you get comfortable with 
you know, managing your emotions and owning the fact that, you know, you need to first of all have self-control. You need to have self-mastery before you can go and connect with your kids and influence them in any sort of way. And we go back to the quote you mentioned earlier, which I love, by the way, it's beautiful. We are not meant to lead kids whose hearts we, we, are, we do not hold. Do not hold. That's so, right. So let's go That's there. How, right. do we, how do we start? I think the first thing you have to recognize as a parent is that you cannot teach what you don't know, right? You just, you just can't. Um, if, you, if you grew up uh, in a place that was predominantly in English speaking, I'm sure your kids don't speak Japanese because you don't know Japanese and you don't speak Japanese. <laughs> but if you were a household that was multi multilingual, the kids might speak two languages, right? So first own the fact that you can't teach what you don't know. The second thing is I've designed a, uh, an emotional ladder. It's a ladder that takes you, and I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Mm. Um, and there's going to be a PDF that you guys can download so that you can you can see it in more detail. But it takes you from all the way at the bottom, feeling fear and depression and powerlessness, feeling like a victim. Somebody's done something to me. Yeah? All the way up to joy and empowerment and freedom and love and appreciation. And because this is a ladder, there are some rules that go along with a ladder. So I was like to kind of go through the rules and I'm just going to pull my piece of paper to make sure I don't forget <laughs> any of them. The first thing is, it looks just like a ladder. So if you think of a ladder, there are some rules for using a ladder. You can climb a ladder one step at a time. When you get really comfortable and you're skilled, you may be able to skip a step. Yeah. But generally, you have to go up that ladder one step at a time. But... From the top of the ladder, you can do one swoop and fall right to the bottom. You don't need to come down mm. one step at a time, right? So yeah. the climb is a little more effort than the fall. So you got to bear that in mind, right? So it means that if you don't guard the emotions of love and appreciation and excitement, if you don't hold that as most a valuable thing and you don't guard it, it's easy for somebody to throw you off balance. Mm. And you give them the ownership rather than recognizing the ownership is based on how I was thinking about what's happening. And you fall all the way down to anger or, or depression or fear or sadness. The next thing is to recognize that each step of the ladder changes your perspective. So what you can see when you're at the bottom of the ladder is very different to what you can see when you're at the top of the ladder. And it's the same for your emotions. What you can see when you look out and you look through the eyes of anger or fear is very different when you look out at your world through the eyes of love and excitement and joy. And, and this really goes back to understanding that what you focus on, you get more of. If I asked you to um, close your eyes and then open your eyes, quickly look around the room and look for everything that's brown. Yeah, you look quickly and I say, okay, close your eyes. Tell me, how many brown things did you see? You can tell me how many brown things. But if I said, tell me how many blue things did you see? You go, mm, um, maybe two. <laughs> then you start to look at things that are close to, close to blue. It might be kind of blue-green, and you want to make that blue so you can add a number in. Because your mind wasn't looking for it, right? So you only see what you and, and that's just the way your mind works. Your mind actually receives about 2 million bits of information a second, but it can only process wow. about 10 bytes mm. so what that means is that there's this whole host of information coming at you and your brain has to figure out a way to just filter just a small portion of it in so what it does it goes back and it says what feels familiar what matches a previous experience or previous belief let's take that leave all the rest so you're basically seeing what matches what you already believe and so you've got to really manage what you believe, manage what state you're in in order to manage the experiences that you have. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. Okay. The next, the, next rule, the next rule for the ladder is that each step of the ladder has a purpose and it supports you. So no matter how low you are on the ladder or how high you are on the ladder, each step is important. So don't disregard one because it feels like it's called a dark emotion. Yeah, it doesn't have any less of a purpose to a nice, light, happy emotion. All of them are important. Um, and then there's two, two or three more that I throw in because this is emotions and not just a physical ladder. Um, and the one to recognize is that there is momentum. 
So when you're climbing a ladder, you start the climb and it's a little slow. But as you go up, you get momentum and you can actually move faster. It's the same when you're coming down. You usually come down and you start off slowly, but then you start to build the momentum. Your emotions are the same because your thoughts attract thoughts similar to, to you. So if you start off with a thought of anger, an emotion has a wave of 17 seconds. So within 17 seconds, this emotion says, okay, you need to bring another thought like this for me to continue this emotion. Mm. So, and then another thought, and then another thought, and then that momentum just builds and builds. So you've got 17 seconds to say, mm -mm, this thought is not the road I want to go down. I'm going to pull up the handbrakes here, find another thought so I can feel another way and slow that momentum down. Um, so that, that momentum will pull you in either direction, right? It'll either pull you up or pull you down. And then each step on the ladder, I like to consider a doorway to the world. So where I am really determines the experiences I will have. If I get up and I am really mad, somebody pissed me off today, I'm so upset and I'm angry and I leave the house and I interact with my kids from that place, come on, we're late now. What you realize is that the whole day spills over into that energy. And there's lots of experiences that will come to you that matches that energy. This is if I've taken the time and I've started my day, I have spent time with myself, put myself in a peak state. Then even when my kids come and nobody wants to put their clothes on, nobody wants to go to school today, I'm still in a happy mood. We can do this by having fun and playful. And then all the experiences that come to me that day match that emotion that I've started with. And so those are the rules for, for, for the ladder. And I think they're worth studying because you have to really get them in order to own them, right? You have to really say, mm, I'm feeling this way and I want to say it's about you. I want to say you made me feel like this. And you got to own why this is about me so that you can own your power. And then, then the ladder becomes a simple tool to use. And you literally, like you would any other ladder, you start wherever you are. So you got to first, you got to claim it. You got to name it to claim it, right? So you got to say, where am I? How do I feel? Okay, I'm angry. I'm really angry. So you start on anger. And I say to people, get really specific about what you're angry about. Even if it means you're saying it to you. You said this or you didn't do the thing you were going to say. You didn't do the thing you're going to do. You were behind my back, whatever it is, right? And this is why I am angry. And then you want to pull up. So after anger, you've got sort of discouragement. You know what? I feel so helpless because this is usually what you do all the time. And no matter how much I talk to you about it, I can't seem to get you to move on. And then you go to blame. And then you go to worry and to doubt. And you slowly, and you use the words of each step of the ladder, and it helps you climb. And before you know it, you're at contentment. And before you know it, you're a joy and optimism. And that's the place where you then say, okay, let me look at this again. What should I do about this situation? Mm. Because from that place is where, again, you have your clarity, you have your intuition, you've got your creativity. That's the place you want to make all your decisions from. Fantastic. So what, what I'm hearing you say right now, Nicole, is the ladder is a tool that helps you to get to your peak state. That's it. That's it. And, and I usually recommend that people practice in writing first. So take two events of the week. Don't, don't go for the biggest ones. Yeah? Start yourself off with baby steps. Take two small events for the week where you know, look, this, this will be off balance. Yeah? Um, and write. Because when you write, there's a connection between both sides of your brains. Write and then go up that ladder. And you do that a few times. And as you do that, what will happen is that you actually rewire your thought process. So that, that after maybe four or five weeks of just doing two of those a week, then you find that you'll start to think that way. You'll start to think that, okay, I'm angry. I'm comfortable. But when you write, because you know, it, look, I'm not acting on this. I'm just writing it. You get to be more comfortable because you have to be comfortable with emotions like revenge because they're on the ladder. And the reason you need to be comfortable is because each emotion that you move up to gives you relief from the last emotion. Mm. And you need that relief to allow you to climb and to climb. So, so writing is something that I definitely recommend for at least four or five weeks.
Okay, guys, there was a little bit of a problem with the actual internet connection. Um, you guys must be thinking we have really bad connection here in the UK, but <laughs> there was a little bit of a problem with the connection. Um, the picture froze a couple of times uh, and the, the frame actually shrunk down a little bit, but we did manage to catch everything on the audio that Nicole was saying. So uh, that that's what happened and I'm gonna include that in the actual uh, final version of the video because I think what Nicole was saying was really important um, and uh, we, we we got all the audio. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the golden nuggets that we're after. And, uh, you know, the quality of the video should not make an impact on, on our learning. So let's focus on our learning. And, uh, I, I just really appreciate you sharing that with us, Nicole. I think the latter idea is really fantastic. And thank you for actually sharing the tool with us and talking us through it. Um, because it's, it's a step-by-step -step process. And for a lot of people, they want instant results. Like I'm one of those people, right? Like I want instant results right now. Okay, I want results yesterday, last week, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it, it's great to have a tool that we can use because things like thoughts and emotions are very abstract. We can't physically manipulate them. And I think that's really difficult. That's really hard. I find it really difficult. Like, for example, when I'm going in the negative thought cycle, like I really have to like stop. It's like, dude, shut up. Like, what are you doing? Like, you have to have that level of conversation with yourself mm -hmm. before I can break out of it, right? Right? So it's, 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 it's difficult, but I'm glad that we have a tool that we can use to, to start to help us develop um, the, 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 the kind of like thought process that will get us to our peak state. Uh, absolutely. And it's, it's not an overnight solution. Right? It's not it's not a flip a switch and instantly we're OK. And and that's simply because we've spent all of our lives thinking and processing our thoughts in one way and now it's time I, in, in fact i like to say sometimes our mind thinks us because we just let it go and it just goes and goes and goes as opposed to us actually deliberately using our mind to create the outcome we want and that's what this is about it's about developing that level of mastery where you say this is my mind and i get to decide how it's used and what it's going to produce for me. Uh, and it's about focus. I recommend that people practice meditation, but really probably study a little bit about what meditation is. There's a lot of myth going on that meditation is about clearing your mind. It isn't. It's about developing focus. So if you're focusing on your breathing, how long can you stay just focus on your breathing? Mm. And as the mind wanders, you bring your mind back and you focus on your breathing you can focus on the flame of a candle you can focus on a sound in the room just it's about bringing yourself back and staying focused and the practice of meditation is about okay well today i probably maintain focus for 10 seconds let's see how long well, i can do it tomorrow and if you keep at it in a month's time you should be able to at least sit there and get a solid three four five minutes of proper focus and that focus then then supports you when you're trying to develop emotional mastery because it's about that focus of thought. So when you say to yourself, like you were saying just now, you talk to yourself and you say, stop, yeah, stop thinking that. It's the same. You've got, you've got that 17 second wave of an emotion before you decide what comes next. That's the time for you to really zone in and focus. That's the time for you to say, what do I want to think here? How do I want to feel here? Yeah, what, what do I need to do? To bring the best of me to this situation mm. and that's where you make the choice to keep your focus and move yourself to a place where you can bring the best of yourself and really I think as parents that's that's our number one responsibility we talk a lot about all sorts of different things that we have to do for our kids and to our kids but the reality is the number one thing you can do for your kids is to show up as the best of who you are so you show up in peak state all the time so they have access to see what love looks like as it pours out of you. That's what you want to do for your kids. Oh, that's, that's amazing. I, I, I love how you actually broke that down for us. And also what's really fascinating is that you, you talk about the emotions having a wave that lasts 17 seconds. Now, 
I had never thought about emotions as waves. And I suddenly didn't think that it had a time limit on it. So it's actually really fascinating to learn that. And you obviously shared some strategies with us on like how we can take control and how we can actually, you know, things around and what kind of questions we can ask ourselves. Because, you know, asking questions is great. Like the, the way to direct your thoughts in a certain direction is just by asking questions that will automatically lead you, your thoughts um, to, or, or get your brain to think about things in, in that direction or in that manner. So I, I think questions are a great tool uh, to take control of your thoughts. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm wondering if what, what can we do to actually kind of pass it on to our kids? How do we pass on this emotional mastery to our kids? Is it just enough to just talk to them about these models? Is it just enough to tell them about this and talk, you know, show them the ladder and tell them how they can move through the ladder? Is that going to be enough or do we need to do anything else? I think the only thing you need to do is model the way. Your kids learn to walk because you walk. They learn to talk because you talk. And if you can master this, the language you have within your home will change. Rather than saying, you got, you got me so angry, you will then say, I got angry. When this happened, I got angry. You'll be able to change all of your conversations. So the conversations that usually produce conflict will now come from a place of responsibility and can we figure this out together? So now what I say to my kids is, you know what? When you did that, I interpret it to mean that you were being rude to me. Mm. And that made me feel really sad inside. I felt sad. But I know that it can't be true. And that's not the way I want to feel. So can we sit and work it out together? And then you give your kids some real empowerment because then they know no matter how old they are, you trust them to work things out with you. And so they've got a language. They now know, mommy doesn't say you've made me feel. So clearly, if mommy's saying I feel because of this, I have to say I feel. So really, we're, we're teaching the only way we can teach by modeling. Yeah, um, there's, there's a famous line that I learned from one of the experts, which is words don't teach. Mm. And I tell parents that all the time because we say the same thing over and over. I remember I used to say, I've said to you a thousand times. And then he said, well, if you're saying it a thousand times, who's actually slow at learning? <laughs> so I, say that. <laughs> I love that. Oh, man, I love that. So, yeah, so you, you kind of need to take a step back and recognize that it isn't about what you say to kids. It's about how you live. Mm. They learn to be kind by watching you be kind. They learn to be understanding by how understanding you are towards them. So anything you want them to master, and definitely if you can give your kids any tool, this is the best tool for life. Because it means no matter what situation they're in, they can find a path back to themselves. Some of the people that we admire most in the world, the people that have made great impact, people like Nelson Mandela, have been in situations that we think just they're unthinkable, but have found a way back to themselves so that they can approach a situation from a place of love, place of compassion and understanding. And that's, that's the best gift we can give to our kids. No matter what's happening, you can find a way to be okay always. Mm. Yeah, and I, and I think that's really important because one of the things that I think we have a responsibility to teach our kids is they had a sense of identity, who they are. And if we can model that for them to say, this is who I am. I'm not the kind of person who screams and shouts at you. I'm not the kind of person who smacks you. I'm not the type of person who will hold a grudge against you. I'm not the type of person who will drag you down, who will actually say mean things to you and break your confidence. If, you, if we can model that for them, then they have a sense of identity too. Like, hey, like this, this, is, this is something that I want as well. Like, I am not the type of person who does that because my parents never did that for me. My parents never made me experience this. But you see, this level of emotional mastery also mm. makes parenting easier, right? So if you can get to this level and you can then just think of a child that's spending the bulk of their time feeling love, feeling appreciation, feeling enthusiasm for life. And then think of a child that's feeling um, sad, feeling rejected, feeling disappointed. Think of what you're going to get from both of those kids. 
think of the interactions you will have mm. and you realize that if you can just take your kids up that ladder where they're in two themselves they, you get the best of them and what's more and sometimes this is scary for parents but it's it's the absolute truth what's more is that they tap in to the absolute best guidance they can have better than the guidance that we can give them they tap into their own inner being because sometimes we want to think we know what's best for them always but they've come with their own blueprint and their own path and and their own goals for for their time here and and it's sometimes it's not in alignment with ours and the only way they can find that is if we allow them to hone in and stay connected to that inner voice and and the reality is we're not always going to be around them to make sure they turn left when they need to and right when they need to they say please and thank you when they need to we're not going to always be there so the best way to get them to to live a life from a place of compassion and love and joy for everybody is really to teach them to tap in there and to stay connected mm. yeah yeah i love it and i think if we are focused on creating a rich experience for our kids from a very young age, then I think we will have more control in, in those situations when we are about to lose it, when we are, you know, <laughs> just overwhelmed by emotion. Because at the end of the day, our focus will be like, how can I create a rich environment for my children? How can I create a rich experience for my children? So even though this situation is bad, even though this situation is, 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 is it's completely out of line, but my main focus is to create a rich environment for my kids and to create a rich experience for my kids. So I think that's really important as well, that we, we focus on those things. So that's always in the back of our mind, regardless of whatever's going on around us. Absolutely. And, and we can see that in certain settings. When we become pregnant as a family, we know what we need to do is create a beautiful environment. So mom has beautiful nourishing food. She drinks lots of water, fresh air. She moves her body so that she has enough exercise. She, the environment around her is light and happy. So she creates the best environment. No parent tries to grow legs and fingernails and hair. <laughs> they leave that up to nature right yeah. all they know they have to do is create the right environment and then that baby is born and it's beautiful and we say oh my gosh thank you so much god we'll take over now and we go on <laughs> and we say okay now we get to decide what you will grow and how you will grow and we forget that all we need to do is do exactly what we did then just create a beautiful environment and that child will flourish yeah, yeah. I thought what you were going to say there, you know, when you said, you know, we get a beautiful baby and we say, thank God, I'll take over from here. And then I thought what you're going to say next was like, then we go on a rampage. We do. We absolutely do. Because as a new mom, I'll tell you what we do, right? We get, we get so scared of everything. Are they mm -hmm. eating enough? Feed us some more. Are they moving enough? Do they have the enough, the right toys? Are they learning fast enough? It's, it's so long since they, everybody else is creeping. They're not creeping like we're on some sort of race. Ooh, they're taking so long to get their first tooth. Everything we make into a competition, a race. Yeah. And it's almost like we're trying to push them rather than just letting them be and letting them just flourish and flow. Just create that environment for them to grow beautifully and they will. Mm, yeah i love that and, and to be honest with you I, I was sharing this you know again with you before we started recording um the fact that when when i had my kids i was i was mortified i was just like how is this gonna happen like i i come from a broken family i'm i'm, I'm you know i grew up like pretty dysfunctional myself how am i gonna do this this is gonna be like you know I, i'm gonna i'm gonna break them or i'm gonna I'm going to, I'm going to mess them up in some way. Right. Um, but you're right. Like it, it is a journey. And now I, I can't imagine my life without my kids. You know, we, we have a really close sort of relationship. Um, we spend a lot of time together doing different things and I, I'm actually making sure that I make the effort to explore and do the things that they're interested in. And it, it has been an absolutely uh, fantastic journey simply because I, I approach it from, from that sort of mindset. Mm. Here's what, I, and I shared with you before, Dr. Gabor Mate said to me, just face it, you have messed your kids up. <laughs> and that's yeah. one that it hit me hard, yeah, it hit me hard, but I pondered on it. And, and I thought about it from in a, 
let's look at what's, what's the meaning of life sort of perspective. Why would it be natural for parents to pass pain on? And I said, you know what? We're here to evolve, to evolve life, right? So if we think about it and we go back, as humans, we once lived in caves. From that point to now, as a planet, we didn't get anything new. There was no new resources being trucked in from another planet. All that happened is that from generation to generation, we felt pain and say, mm, I don't want to feel like that. Ooh, this is the way I want to feel. And we moved towards that. And I think the parent-child dynamic is that foundation, that sort of a bed, if you will, like if you will kind of have in a garden where you do pass your pain on, but that's for the next generation to go, mm, 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 we're not doing that. This is what I prefer. And they evolve and create a solution and move. And so from generation to generation, we can evolve. So I think we need to just kind of let go of the guilt, put it aside. We carry it around like a big heavy bag everywhere we go as parents. Just accept the fact that that's part of life, that you would pass on some of your pain, but know that it's going to work to have your kids evolve, have them grow, have them be stronger, better equipped for their role in their generation. So it's not all a bad thing, right? Um, and if you can, if you can own that pain, if you can acknowledge it to your kids. Uh, so I usually, I, I have a very open relationship with my kids and I'll say, mommy's still figuring that out. I haven't learned to do that yet. Because kids sometimes think their parents are on a pedestal they're kings and queens and they've got it all figured out and they know exactly what to do and I'm just real with my kids I'm human too and yes by now I should have figured out how to do this but I haven't I'm still working on it and I'm still learning on it and that means that I may not do the best for you in this area but it doesn't have to stop there our motto in our home is we can figure anything out together mm. and when I'm close to being triggered I say it, it's almost like a mantra. We can figure anything out together. When my kids are losing it and I can see the steam starting to build in them, I say it, mm, remember, we can figure anything out together. And that kind of helps everybody get calm because they know there's no judgment. They know that mommy's open and vulnerable to say where she's still learning and developing so that they can have a safe space to do the same. And that together we will figure it out. And I think if you can create that, you create an unstoppable team. Mm, I love I love the whole idea of teamwork that you talked about right there. I think that's really important as well because a lot of the times it's just dictatorship, right? Like I am the parent, I am the mm. guardian, I'm in charge, I'm responsible, I tell you what to do. But this whole idea of teamwork, mm. I, it just creates a complete different dynamic. I totally agree with you. I think you know, for people in the audience, just try it. Okay. You know, if you haven't tried it before, just try it. Just like talk to your kids and be like, Hey, let's work on something together. And one of the things like that I've introduced uh, with my kids is that every single day we come, we sit on the dinner table, we always eat together. Um, and uh, we, we talk about what's the one hard thing that we've all done today. What's the hard thing that we did. Okay. That you found really hard. It was, it, it took a lot of effort and uh, you, 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 you were finding it really challenging to carrying on with it or whatever, but you didn't give up. So let's talk about it. Let's explore something. And then they realize, you know, by exploring this sort of thing together that, Hey, we, we actually are on, on the same level. Like, you know, there's stuff that daddy struggles with, right? On a daily basis. And it is not necessarily the same thing as different things or there's stuff that, you know, we both struggle with or mommy struggles with. Like we're all on the same level here. We're all on the same team. We're just like going out and doing different things and trying to, you know, find solutions to problems or trying to achieve different goals, etc., in our own way. But we all are struggling with things. That's absolutely beautiful. And I think as parents, sometimes when you get into that space, you have to be ready to be flexible. So mm. one of the first challenges we tackled as a family together was getting out of the house in the morning. It tends to be a hard one for a lot of parents. And so we sat down, I sat with the boys and I said, listen, we need to do better. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can hear you. Yep. We need to do better. We're leaving too late and then we're rushing. We're all flustered and we're not getting to enjoy our last moments of the day together before we go separate ways. So what can we do differently to make sure we leave earlier? And my younger son could have been about maybe about six at the time, six or seven. And he said, I know what I'll do. 
I'll get dressed for school in the night. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I'm going to go to sleep in my uniform. So when I get up, I'm already dressed. That's and my first thought was, my first thought was, of course, you're not going to do that. And then I thought, <laughs> I have to I have to own my space of working this out together. Mm. So that's his solution. I'm going to say, okay, baby, let's try it for a couple of days and see how it goes. Mm. If it goes well, well, that's a workable solution. If it doesn't and we need to make some tweaks, we'll come back and talk about it and see what else we could do. Well, the first two mornings he got up, he was drenched in sweat <laughs> because <laughs> he was sleeping <laughs> in his full uniform on his duvet. So each morning we then had to take a shower. So after the second one, I'm like, I don't know if this is actually faster or if we're spending more time in the morning getting yeah. ready. And he goes, I don't think it's working, mommy. We need another solution. Mm. But he was so empowered that I would actually follow through on his suggestion that he was then open and eager for my guidance for what the next solution should have been. Mm. And that's what you want to achieve. Oh man, I love that story. It's hilarious, by the way, but I love the story and, and <laughs> that's fantastic. I love it. And uh, you know, th that's amazing. The fact that you actually gave him that the option to say, Hey, you know what, we'll, we'll try this. We'll try this for a couple of days. Let's see how it goes. And I think that's really important as a parent as well, that you do kind of, that your kids should have confidence in you, right? Like, you know, mom or dad or whoever, they, they're going to listen to me. They are actually going to take my advice on board. Um, and, and we're, we're going to explore this together. And like we said, you know, we are, we, we are a team. We're going to work this out together. And that's really important. And I, I'm going to share a similar story with the, from another guest who actually came on the channel. Uh, and uh, she was saying that I think it was um, her client, one of her clients, and, and um, the, she had a really young child as well, about the same sort of age, about six years old. And in the morning, he will go on the iPad and play like Fortnite all morning and, and be really late, you know, to go to school. And, you know, she would like have tried everything, yeah, getting screaming, you know, whatever, you know, no pocket money, etc. But like just nothing worked. He was just addicted to playing this video game. So she one day was just like, okay, fine, I give up. Like, tell me what will work. Let's sit down. Let's figure this out together. Okay. So tell me how can we leave on time? Cause that's something we really have to do. I have to go to work. You have to go to school. What can we do to, to, to figure this thing out together? And he just turned around and said, well, just turn off the Wi-Fi in the morning. Like I'm, I can't stay away from the video game. I can't stay away from the iPad. Just turn off the Wi-Fi. And she's like, magic. There you go. That's like perfect solution. And she's like, I've tried everything like nothing worked <laughs> but there, there you go right kids are pretty smart they're pretty intuitive the, you see, the beauty, they're so intuitive but the beauty of that is if she had turned the wi-fi off on her own without that conversation it would have felt like punishment to him mm. it would have felt that would have created a power struggle but because she took the time first to say let's work it out together even though it's a solution against what he wanted to do, it's now something he's bought into. So when the yeah. Wi-Fi goes off, there's no tantrum, there's yeah. no fussing. He just knows, okay, it's time to go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, and and I think there's there's a quote from uh, one of the earlier guests, uh, actually our mutual friend, I believe, uh, Sue DeCaro, who I actually uh, also had on the channel, and I'll put that link below in the description uh, for people to go and check that interview out. It was absolutely phenomenal. She is world class, beautiful. and one of yeah, she, she one is. of yes, and she's the one who actually introduced us, right? Um, but she she yes, says she did. Yeah, yeah, that's how we connected. But she says that our children are here to help us grow. And that is just so powerful. I love it. You know, such, such a Absolutely. deep, powerful thought, such a deep, powerful concept. And she's like, our children are here to help us heal the things that have happened to us. And we don't know how to heal them. And that's why children come here. And we sometimes we face resistance from our children, but that's essentially what they're there for. And it's such a deep, powerful thought. Um, I, I totally bought into that. Like ever since you started, like that's, that's been on my mind. I'm totally bought into that. And you, you were saying the same, same, same things uh, about emotional mastery. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we have to obviously pass this on to our children, but actually we can learn from them as well. Absolutely. There's, there's a story from uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer that mm. I love to tell to parents. And he says, if I gave you an orange and you squeezed it, what would you get out of it? 
and he asked it of a little boy and a little boy looked at him like what kind of silly question is that of course i'll get orange juice and he said is it possible to get apple juice no it's an orange and he's like exactly so when you squeeze something what you get out of it is what's already on the inside mm. and so my challenge to parents is when life squeezes you you've got to figure out how you can show your kids what love looks like when it pours out of you mm. and when something else beside love pours out you have to recognize it's pouring out because it's already on the inside and it's your work to go figure out why it's there and how to get it out so that love can pour out of you so beautiful um so so beautiful I, I was i was i was actually getting goosebumps as you said that i was actually getting goosebumps such a deep powerful idea such a deep powerful concept but also the fact i think it's really important to show our kids love in those dark moments because yes, yeah because then then they can then they can experience that that even though you know there will be hard times in life there will be adversity there will be dark days but I will always have something that I can go back to, something that will center me, something that will bring me to my highest self. Yes, absolutely. And I think that is what unconditional love is. As mm. parents, we, we, fling, we fling the phrase around very, of course, I love my kids unconditionally. But unconditional love means that I love you without conditions. You don't have to dance. You don't have to perform. You don't have to please me. My love for you is not based on you. My mm. love for you is a choice that I have made. I'm going to love you irrespective of what you do. That's what unconditional love is. And very few kids get the opportunity to experience that because we use the words without actually knowing what it means and being able to bring it to our life. And, it, and it's a challenge. It is a challenge when they're... When you have to face the fact that in this moment, I'm not being loving and it has nothing to do with anybody else but me, it's sometimes a hard pill to swallow. But as I said earlier on in the interview, if you can find the courage, and it does take courage, if you can find the courage to look within in those moments, there are such easy tools that you could use to release the pain that still lies within, so that when you squeeze the orange, the anger doesn't come out and the hurt doesn't come out, but the love comes out, and then you have the opportunity to really show your kids what unconditional love looks like. And, and, and as parents of younger kids, we, we don't think of what it would be like when they're older in their teens and maybe early 20s but I use that as my foundation of how I want to treat my kids today so when I think of my sons at 16 17 18 I want them to know when they have a problem they can still come to me when they've messed up they can still come to me when they think they've done the worst things in the world I remember being that age thinking I can't tell my mother what I have done Mm. She is going to be so disappointed. She will never understand. But what I did was I blocked myself off of getting guidance. So what I want for my kids is for them to know they can come and tap into guidance, irrespective of what they've done, irrespective of the situations they found themselves in. And I can't wait till they're 16, 17, 18 to do that. I have to show them that each and every day so that when they get to that age, they already know they can come to me for that. Yes. And I think it's really important that the kids uh, not just know, but absolutely believe in the fact that your relationship with them, the, your love for them is never in question. There's a situation that's come up that's right. caused some sort of tension, that's caused some sort of resistance. And it's that situation that we're going to deal with as a team. We're going to figure this out. Yes, it's made me upset. Yes, I am feeling angry. But... I still love you and our relationship will still stay the same once we've gone past it. Nothing else has changed. I think that's really important as well because a lot of the times, you know, kids almost feel, um, you can say, left out or alone or they, they feel like my, my parents don't love me and it, they, like there's certain conditions that I must satisfy in order to gain their acceptance. So I think it's really important that, that we are very open with our kids and actually explain to them that our relationship, our you know, love for you, that's never in question. It's just the situation. It's just the thing you did that's in question. Yeah. And, and if you can separate the challenge from the people 
yeah you could so so the challenge is this yeah the challenge is leaving the house on time the challenge is getting our chores done and keeping our home healthy and tidy if you can separate that as opposed to saying you are always late you never get dressed on time you always drop your stuff all over the house those are two different conversations and yeah. one instills and supports teamwork and the other just causes conflict mm, yeah very powerful um for people in the audience i mean there's been just so many golden nuggets that have come out of this conversation and i i've loved every moment of it okay and there have been times where like i've 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 had goosebumps and i'm going to share this with you check this out i've got a whole page of notes all right can you see that there's a whole page of notes <laughs> from this conversation all right so i hope you guys have been taking notes time does restrict us uh, but uh, before we go nicole a uh, couple of things number one can anybody gain emotional mastery or do you have to be a certain type of person who can who can gain certain uh, emotional mastery Oh, absolutely anybody can gain emotional mastery. Emotional mastery is really about learning how to manage your thoughts. And as long as you can think for yourself, you can learn emotional mastery. So it's something kids can learn. In fact, kids are probably better at learning emotional mastery than adults because they still remember that the important thing in life is to be happy. <laughs> They're always trying to find some way back yeah. to their happiness, right? Yeah. So, so it's absolutely open to anyone. Amazing. Um, Nicole, this has been an absolute pleasure. I'm really glad that we had this conversation. Um, and, and to be honest, you know what? I love to stay on and explore so many other <laughs> things with you, but time does restrict us. So uh, can you tell us how people can find out more about you, more about your course, more about your coaching, um, and how can they reach out to you? Sure. So you can find us on empoweredkidstv.com um, and the Connected Family Blueprint course. You can find that at academy.empoweredkidstv.com. You can reach us, reach us on Facebook. Um, we're on Twitter, just all the social media things on YouTube. Um, and we're always happy to help. So you can drop us a note, drop us a message. If there's something you're struggling with, just drop us a line and I'll get back to them personally. Amazing. Um, Nicole, is there anything we can help you with by now? No, I just think I want to, I want to end by sharing with, with, with everyone that's listening that if they can really make the commitment to, to finding their own joy. And I mean, it's, it's not a hard price to pay, right? I'm asking you to find your joy. If you can make the commitment to find your joy, it will transform not just your family, not just your parent-child relationship, but every single area of your life. It really is the part to everlasting joy and a life of fulfillment. And it's something that I want everybody to be able to experience. Mm, amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that, Nicole. And for people in the audience, if you are a parent, if you are a potential parent, it doesn't matter. If you are a guardian, if you're a teacher, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you make that commitment. And Nicole, I mean, she's she's just so amazing. She's shared some really amazing strategies with us about emotional mastery. She's explained what emotional mastery is, why it's super important that we actually gain emotional mastery and it takes practice yes it really takes practice but you can get there isn't your end goal to be the best parent in the world to your children is that what your goal is it should be i hope it is mine is nicole's is and i'm pretty sure yours is too and you might not have kids right now but maybe one day you will have kids and you want to get to a point where you can go and you can be the best parent to your kids. And what that will require you to do is walk this path to gain emotional mastery. A lot of the times, I mean, think about it. You wanted to become a lawyer, you want to become an accountant, you want to become a builder, you want to become an electrician, guess what? You went through primary school, you went to secondary school, you went to college, you went to university, you did a lot of professional training, you spent a lot of money, time, energy, and effort in developing yourself in that way, okay? And on this channel, we explore holistic success in all areas of your life. And parenting is one area of life which is usually left out. There's no formal sort of education around it. There's no GCSE you can do in it. There's no A-level you can do in it. There's no sort of formal educational sort of institution set up to, to help you with this. 
we're left on our own to figure this out and it's a really big area and a lot of people struggle with it and here you have a chance we have somebody who's absolutely world class and she came on and she gave us her time her expertise her skills her knowledge her experiences just so we can apply those things in our lives and accelerate our lives so i will highly encourage you to go ahead and click those links below in the description of the video reach out to nicole um and she is happy to help okay she's really open she cares and that's a big one she really cares all right she wants you to succeed she's been she's walked the path she's she talks about her story very openly she said she had pain in her own life and that's what got her started and maybe you can relate maybe you have pain in your life in this area of parenting so go ahead and reach out to nicole and i i promise you you will not be disappointed Apart from that, guys, as always, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Really appreciate it. The, the, the commitment, my commitment to come and serve you guys every single week is real, okay? And it, it's witnessed by the fact that regardless of what happens, you know, I've got a full-time job, I've got a family, I come here and I try and make sure I bring on amazing guests so we can explore these different areas of life that usually are not talked about. So we can, we can accelerate our lives and I just want to share those conversations, those ideas with you. The best compliment you can give me and all these amazing guests is to just pay it forward. Pass it on to somebody who needs to hear these ideas, these concepts, these things, so they can accelerate their lives. Hey, maybe your friends, uh, some of them might be parents or they might be potential parents. They might be engaged, they might be getting married, whatever, they might be pregnant. Share it with them, man. That, that, I think that would be amazing. And also, don't forget to subscribe hit the subscribe button because not only will all the future conversation land in your inbox but you get entered into the channel competition the monthly channel competition where you get a chance to win a free access pass to my new networking strategies course based on all the strategies that i have used to find, connect, and build relationship with all these amazing thought leaders, including Nicole and Sue DeCaro, our mutual friend who was on the channel before. That link will also be below in the description. So with that, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Nicole, once again, you're absolutely awesome. Thanks for coming here. Thank you. All right, guys, stay awesome. Hustle hard, like it says back there, and I'll catch you in the next one.